on uh, not sure how many people you wait for. I would but... just I would wait one more minute and then we should get started um, cool. for the sake of time. Oh, is that Colleen? Hi, Colleen, one time. Hello, it's so good to see you. Oh my goodness, I miss you. It's been, it's been over a decade. Oh my God, don't say it. <laughs> Stop this. We need to play, we need to play soon. Yeah, to yeah totally. Or I'll come to the you. The problem with this <laughs> eye stuff is that everything's connected to everything. So my phone rings, it knocks my computer out. It's so weird. <laughs> I'm like what happened um escape what happened to my powerpoint just because my phone rang the powerpoint went away let me go back to this do you want to close it and then open it oh wait i kind of see it off to the right it's like it slid a slide over to the to the or your slide is really giant and wide. Your screen sharing is paused. Oh, um, resume share. Got it. So weird. <laughs> okay. Mysterious. We figured it out. Okay. I'm going to see if i could wait 27 is a really good number of yeah, participants a lot of people there. divisible by many things what's our okay. ai pardon what's our ai oh honor ai is a transcription service that goes from uh i guess voice to text Oh, got it, got it, got it. So there's a like, if they need to, they could read what I'm saying. Exactly. Got it, got it, got it. That's crazy. <laughs> Learn so many things when you do talk with puppies. There you go. All right, everybody. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we officially start from our kind of self start? I'd like to uh, welcome Kenneth, who I'll introduce in a second. I'd like to welcome everyone back from spring break. Um, I'd like to welcome all of us to Cloud Salon. And uh, being that we're about to talk about design in relation to uh, social arrangements, spatial systems, and systems of power, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Lenape people, the original inhabitants of Manhattan, which of course, the precursor of Manhattan and the land that the new school and university is built on. Um, forcible occupation of the still unceded land, even despite the fact that there's Lenape people across North America, uh, is a precursor for some of the systems of oppression that remain ongoing in our society. And as designers and people who are settled in the US, we must continue to question that. Considering this, um, and on that note, it is my honor to introduce Kenneth Bailey, who does work in this area. He is the co-founder of the Design Studio for Social Invention. His interests focus on the research and development of design tools for marginalized communities to address complex social issues. With over three dec decades of experience uh, in community practice, Bailey brings a unique perspective on the ethics of design in relation to community engagement the arts and cultural action. He's made many amazing projects with the Design Studio for Social Intervention, otherwise known as DS4SI, including Public Kitchen, Social Emergency Response Center, and his new book, which you can see the cover of, uh, that he co-authored with DS4SI is entitled Ideas, Arrangements, Effects, Systems Design, and Social Justice. 2020. So I uh, welcome you, Kenneth, and um, anytime you want to start, please go ahead. 
Hi, everyone. Um, and thanks, John, for having me um, here. And um, I'm sure John invited me um, to talk a bit about this book, why we wrote it, and get into some of the premises um, covered in it. And so first, I'll start with why we wrote it. Um, we, the, um, myself, um, my colleague, Lori Lobenstein, and at the time, our other colleague, Ayako um, Ayuriyama, who's now um, on faculty at RISD, um, were um, looking to codify how we thought about social design, how we thought about design and social change. And, um, and this framework emerged for us um, really in looking at our own work, almost like the framework came out of reflecting on our own practice and trying to explain to ourselves how it was that we were con conceiving of design and practice in design. And so we really, and um, it also came out of, you know, lots of influence from um, affect theory, um, post-structuralism, um, ideas that, you know, um, Latour was working with in terms of assemblage theory. So, um, but that all really, it was like the, the, the theoretical work really was in the backdrop of this sort of how uh, question we were asking ourselves, like how are we considering or how are we thinking about design so really coming out of our practice of design and the, the theoretical pieces sort of merged with the insights we were having about our own practice and we and we wrote it really to help us understand how we were thinking about design and also to make it more accessible to sort of make this contribution to the larger field and we've gotten good feedback so far so good um and with that I'm going to um, bring us into the initial premise we make in the book um, that really guides our approach to design. And that is I, ideas about the world and ideas about society aren't just floating in the sky and operating in our language. They bring themselves to bear in the material, in the concrete, through the act of arranging social life, through the act of arrangements. Um, which in turn produce good and bad effects. The things that we often see that we might critique are the things we experience that we like. We would say those are effects of an arranged social world um, and, um, and, the, and ideas about the world are, are embedded in those arrangements, ideas, arrangements, effects. Um, so to give you a concrete example of that, um, we have to what we think of as quotidian examples. Um, on one side, the sort of typical arrangement of the US classroom, and on the other side, a more alternative arrangement of the typical US classroom. In the first arrangement where you have um, um, a teacher standing up at a chalkboard and students arranged in chairs and rows and seats, um, where there's a first row, second row, third row, a set of relations emerge. The teacher is up front doing their thing in the regular classroom space and time. You've got people looking up front. You've got a person in the first row um, raising their hand. Um, and one of the things I want to say about what we're looking at in terms of ideas arranged with effects is the physical and social arrangement. So the idea that the teacher is up front and that person who's up front um, with their hand um, raised, there's like a social assumption that that person is a good student um, because they're up front and you know, they're participating. And then as you move further back, um, the, um, the social and the physical arrangement of, I'm not that interested in this class also, um, is um, can emerge, that it's possible to be in the back and be asleep, um, and the fact that they all are sitting. Um, we would say that lots of ideas about power, about the distribution of knowledge, about time, about 
how learning happens properly um, are embedded in the actual normative and social arrangement of the classroom. Um, and that it produces multiple effects. The, the, the literal effects we see produced in this classroom are people in the back who are bored and sleepy. Um, and some of the good effects that, you know, are, are, are what we might think of as normative positive effects would be the student who loves this arrangement, who's up front with her hand up. The point um, is that what we want us to look at is we often don't um, actually look at the classroom as a, a site of ideas um, that are enacted through space and time. Um, and on the, the other side, we have another arrangement of the classroom with another set of ideas at play. Instead of um, the teacher being in front and the students being arranged in chairs in a row, the student is the, the students are arranged in a circle and the teacher's there. There's still a relation between students and teachers, but the circle operates with another kind of idea. And that's, you know, one that's a little more in terms of progressive pedagogy, that everybody has a voice, everybody's faces should be seen. And in that way, you can potentially gather more participation. The point I want to make here is that we are not interested in saying the circle is a good arrangement and the rows are a bad arrangement. What we are trying to really show here is that ideas are embedded in both arrangements. Ideas about learning are embedded in the circle and ideas about um, learning are embedded in the rows and they produce different effects. We aren't saying the, that always, all the time, the effects produced in a circle are good, and always, all the time, the circle, the effects produced in rows are bad. We're saying we have to be able to understand the arrangements of things like classrooms and the arrangements that we operate in in our everyday social lives um, and begin to start to have this kind of conceptual awareness as we move into the world as designers, as people who think about sociality and think about the social as a frame of reference with which to start to challenge when we see effects we don't like, how to um, intervene in them, what to do about them. Um, oh, I have to do it this way. One of the points we wanna make, well, I wanna make, we make in the book and I wanna make here is Oh, let me go back here one second, just to ground what effects are. So effects would be um, on the, in the back here with this student sleep, um, uh, that person being sleep as an individual would be an individual effect. Then there are also social effects that emerge from these kinds of arrangements of lots of things, but in this particular situation with education, one of the effects that can emerge from this form of pedagogy, circle or um, lines, um, just given the fact that people are arranged to sit for hours a day, moving through these forms called classes is ADHD. Um, typically, um, that um, ADHD as a form um, um, is an effect of these classes and is an effect of this larger um, thing called school, but those the effects of ADHD hardly ever send us back to inspect school as a social arrangement or to inspect sitting or to inspect chairs or to inspect the classroom as a kind of social um, um, project as um, an arrangement. Typically, once you get to something like ADHD or you get to board class um, members or teachers or children, or you get to bad literacy rates, whatever, we would call all of those descriptions effects. And by the time you get to those effects, they typically don't send you back up to inspect the arrangements out of which they emerge. And so that's why we have this here saying effects don't naturally send us to the arrangement 
effectively make us do or sort of tend, sort of organize our gaze towards are the affected. Um, and so we tend to, with something like a student who's sleeping, we would normatively say it's that student's fault, they're a bad student. Or with the student with ADA, we would um, organize our gaze and all of our attention towards doing something about that person's inability to withstand or deal with the social engagement they're being asked to find themselves um, in. And another way we often think about this is what we look it's effects and not just people effects. Um, and, and it's with this sort of leaning back to noticing arrangements and then blaming people or looking at people as the culprits in situations versus looking at the larger set of contextual and social conditions out of which uh, 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 a set of effects emerge. So part of what we're here is make us as social designers more aware of all the things, all the, the, the players, human and non-human involved in creating a situation out of which effects emerge. Um, and so, oh, wait a minute. I know how I wanna do this from here. Let me escape this um, and stop here. And I want to, give us a couple of assignments to see if you can start to think with this um, prompt of ideas, arrangements, effects. Um, hold on one second. Um, I'm gonna start with this one. I gotta get free one. This is an experiment for me, so I hope it works. Um, copy this. And then put this in our chat back on Zoom. Um, and ask everyone to click on that Twitter link. And um, and John, can you see that? Yep. Yep. So would you read that? Well, the headline of that Twitter link out loud. <laughs> uh, what's on the image or what's up in the top? I mean, I guess they're kind of the same. Um, women in Berlin can now swim topless in public pools just as men can. So I want you all in the chat to unpack that using the framework ideas, arrangements, effects. What ideas are embedded in this arrangement? What effects are being discussed? What are the arrangements um, operating in this um, um, scenario? Um, let's see how you use the framework to start to actually make sense of this quick scenario. And just type your answers right in the chat. Thank you, Sumi, free the nipple. Yes, one thing being arranged, gender and roles and shirts, indeed. Idea, bodies are bodies, thank you. And there are other ideas that are before the bodies are bodies, there are ideas preceding those ideas having to do with some bodies shouldn't be exposed and other bodies should. And then there's the idea that's coming through this that's about bodies or bodies. Um, thank you. Idea of Berlin is body positive. Idea of gender hierarchy arrangements, what people can wear to swim, effects men considered normative. Um, allowed to do just as men do as if given permission, thanks. Awesome, thank you, Melanie. So, so much about um, this framework, ideal arrangements, ideas, arrangements, effects, it, asks, it brings us in um, a, a way to start making sense of normativity as social designers. Um, 
let's let's um see if we can get two more then i'll put in one more example and then keep moving Two more responses. Effect, pressure to go topless. Perhaps, um, um, that's, a good, that's a good point. Um, maybe stating the obvious, but um, the idea there are only two genders. That's a totally another idea that's at play. And so this framework sort of gives us a way to start looking at how ideas are coming into the material and spatial and social world, not through speech, but through interactions and through the, the built, the making of built form and customs. Um, it's, it's safe for women to go topless, but in, in a particular context, right? It's safe for women to go topless in Berlin in this particular context. Um, uh, that's, and so yes. I'm going to do one more example to allow us to continue to play with these concepts. Let me see if I can just drag this here. I wish I was as um um savvy with uh i'm gonna see if i can just drag this image nope i don't think that's gonna work i think i'm gonna have to copy the um or share on screen oh that's a good idea let me go back to screen share thank you Great idea. Can everyone see the image that, um, John, I'm gonna pick on you again. Yep. Can you read this yep. out loud? I can, and we can see it, or as I can see it. Sometimes it's not the student who is failing the assessment. It might be that the assessment is failing to fully assess the abilities of the student. Uh, spoken by Crystal Frommert, a teacher. So what ideas are embedded or are or, or, um, operating here in terms of ideas, arrangements, effects? What are the ideas? What what are arrangements being, what arrangements are being discussed and what effects are being um, implicated? You could go back to the chat and just put your answers there. One message. Ideas, students need to be assessed, indeed. Let's get four or five more. That student performance um, are typically assessed, but perhaps we should think about pedagogical instruments for um, measurement, indeed. That that instruments um, need to exist. Um, assessments are failing some students. Yes, assessment can be failed. Assessments can be failed. Thank you, Marquise, indeed. And one of the things I wanna to point to that I think this example does well is it takes us from, it takes, it shifts the gauge. We typically only discuss the students or only discuss the teachers and we hardly ever discuss these objects like assessments or um, the report card or um, the all, all of the things that are part of the normative sort of flow of, of education. There are many types of ability, but we only assess some. Thanks. Let's see if we can get two more. Effect. Assessment can be in a modality that is opposite to what is being measured assessing listening by asking students to write answers <laughs> exactly <laughs> let's get one more are we out no, there's nothing else there 
arrangements, teachers assess students, indeed. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna stop share for here and then close this one and go back to sharing my screen big here. Um, hold on one second. How are we doing on time? Um, um, can so I we through? are we are about 20 minutes in. I don't know if you want to speak for another five minutes or so. Okay, that's what I, I'll do that. I'll speak for another five minutes or so. I'm 20 minutes left. I wanted to make sure I, I have enough time for Q&A is the, the thingy. Um, let me go back to my um, initial PowerPoint. Share again. And then I'm going to um, do this part um, fairly fast just to give you another preview of the breakdown between ideas, arrangements, and effects. And so um, one of the things I think we want people to take away with um, and ideas is that um, here is that we're used to, and you can be looking at the pictures and, and using that as a way to also see the kind of sense making we're doing here, um, is that we're used to thinking about or talking about large um, conceptual ideas um, like racism or cis sexism or neoliberalism. We're used to the ISMs as ideas. And one of the things we also want us to pay attention to are ideas that are operating more in the quotidian and the normative and that are like small ideas, like students need to be assessed. Otherwise we don't have a way to know if they are learning what they need to learn or um, we need to keep people safe. And these ideas about safety then lead to all of these other kinds of um, ideas about arrangement. So we want us to be paying attention to the more quotidian and, and small ideas that also are operating in the sphere of holding normativity and, uh, and, and social arrangements that produce worlds that we may not want in power. Um, that's and you can and you read if you read the book you can see us say more about that. Um, just wanted to make that point. Um, with arrangements, um, we it's it's we are looking at physical things like in the classroom, the chair. Um, we're looking at the school board. We're looking at the doors, we're looking at the, the actual physical arrangement and we're also looking at the arrangements of relations. So teacher to student, you know, good teacher, I mean, good student to bad student, um, um, the slacker, um, students who aren't um, engaged at all, all of the social stuff that emerges. We like to say that those hard arrangements and those soft arrangements are overlapping and are informing ideas and are producing effects. So there's like a doubleness that's happening there. And we just want to make us aware of both the physical, the normative social, and other things that are contributing to arrangements. And then I would love to do this, but I don't think we're gonna have time. I think I played out my time to do this exercise um, in, in the early part with that experiment. Um, and so, I will end with saying um, there are um, both small effects that you can be paying attention to, like the effects that happen to us from arrangements, um, or with that in that early example, like the student who was sleep, we can say that student was being affected by that particular class. And we can talk about social effects like ADHD or literacy rates or. Even the thing that everybody's talking about right now on Twitter, the sort of controversy around the new happiness index that just came out, um, that some countries are happier than others. And I think it was a bunch of Nordic countries that won and Israel was in the winning like piece. And so there's lots of hubbub around happiness. Um, but these effects are all sort of being mitigated by a multiplicity of social, cultural, normative arrangements that 
potentially are producing these things that people are calling happiness. And, um, and, and, but they often are talked about as if they're just natural and normal. And so we use this framework, this sort of distributed framework to help us make sense of how we, how, how social problems often are emergent from social phenomena that aren't regularly looked at or inspected having to do with the way we arrange everyday life um, is are informing those arrangements that are hardly, that we hardly give ourselves time to take apart. And, and for us as social designers, we think it's really, really important we be able to look at how social life is arranged um, through inspecting these off-the-looked material and social norms that play out in everyday life if we are to intervene in them. So if you don't understand that we are arranged and that what we're trying to do is sort of take apart uh, the way in which social life is arranged, you always operate at the level of effect. Um, and if and if that's the case it's for a problem like ADHD, if you're trying to change it and you only look at the people who are experiencing it, then you might give pills to people, but you keep all of the situations out of which the ADHD is emerging in place. And so you collude with power. So I know that was super fast. <laughs> we say a lot more about these things in the book. Um, I will open it up to q and A. I I hope that that at least whetted your appetite to read a little bit more about what we're saying in the book. And um, I'm going to turn it over for q and A. I'm going to jump in real quick to start off the q and A. Thank you so much, Kenneth, for laying out the theoretical framework. I personally find it enormously helpful. Um, because we have students here, I'm going to ask you, um, let's see, I'm going to have two questions that I wonder if you might pick some aspect of one of them. One is about world building and one is about imagination. These are more process oriented questions. Um, if a student is then trying to kind of unlearn the normative and to imagine or to analyze world building. Uh, you wrote about citizens and designers needing to think with the audacity of world builders. I thought that was amazing. Do you have any examples of world builders working in any format that have influenced you that you're that you would recommend that we check out? One, that, that or one, the one on one imagination. The quick ones. Oh, can I just do that one really quick? Yeah, um, please. So I love it's a really simple example, but I love it. Um, in, in Bogota, Colombia, um, they had this project where they would shut the entire city down for a night or a day and turn the entire city over to um, women to walk the space. And so men weren't allowed to be in physical space for like a day or a night. And it was only only women could be in space, and um, and women would you know organize parades up and down the streets on the highways like all around the city, and and men just had to be at home. Women would take over the bars. Women take over everything, and it just sort of it just makes us like quickly just question the world. Like, why is it that the that we assume that that space is masculine, um, <laughs> and so. Um, and why is it that women have to keep themselves out of space to be safe? And so it just like, um, um, wait a minute. And so that that's an example of an intervention that sort of points out at other world. Um, and and I think we need these kinds of little jars to just make us sort of aware of normativity and make us sort of like like give us a a, a glimpse into otherwise um and and it's from there that i think world can be imagined um and but if you don't have glimpses into otherwise um you it's 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 it it can like um the the, the what the presenting world can be overwhelming 
um, and you don't necessarily see a way into um, possibility. Um, and so that's an example and why I feel like we have to think with the audacity of world builders is because um, we, we can only do so much at the level of effect. At some point, you have to get up to world. At some point, you have to get up to starting to instantiate reality um, and, and social conditions. And, um, and I know it, it sounds like a, a crazy thing to sort of say out loud, but I'm like, we have to shape social reality. We can't continue to run around in social realities that don't work for us. <laughs> Um, and then let's go to the second question. And I could say more later. You guys can have me back maybe if you think I'm worth coming back. <laughs> or an imagination question. We could go to imagination and people, anyone who has questions, please toss them. Oh, look, Sumi has one. Uh, can you talk about your personal career history and how you came to co-found the Design Studio for Social Intervention? I, I'm a I'm a old um, I mean I've done it in a variety of different ways but you know I'm one of these social change guys um, I organized for a really long time I've done lots of I've played lots of different role in left leaning social justice social change organizations and then I consulted for a really really long time with organizations that are mission aligned really supporting leadership in those kinds of organizations. So I functioned for a really long time as a consultant. And it was there that I started to really pay attention to how institutions think um, and start to really start um, to pay attention to limits to the institutional imaginary and limits to how institutions, particularly left, like I was, I care about, you know, the institutions that are trying to make the world a better place. And I started to notice that a lot of our assumptions about what the social is and about how change happens were in the way of how we how how to create new worlds and and we would miss opportunities to create change because they didn't make sense to us um and i was sort of really struggling with what to do with that and and um was offered an opportunity to get a, a residency at MIT where i learned that a lot of the problems i was struggling with were nor, were normally taken up in the field of design. And that's where I really um, found out that sort of like these ideas of divergent um, thinking and bringing multiple ways of understanding a situation together were normative in design and weren't normative in social justice and social change. So we all are sort of working with the same epistemological habits with no way of questioning them. And so I was like, I, I have to do something about this and try to create some space for research and development and, and, and multiple ways of knowing and thinking in this work. And that's how um, we found ourselves starting DS4SI. Thank you, Sumi. Um, you want to do the imagination question or you want to try to get another question out of the crowd? <laughs> How do you I'm sure, do? I'm sure that someone in this crowd has another question. Pop those babies into the chat. Come on, y'all. And then I want to pick on John and ask John, why does he, why, why does he like this framework? And why did he want me to talk about it? What are your current projects? Hi, Jane. Um, and thanks, Sumi. Um, right now, um, we just opened up our biggest current project. It's here in Boston, and it's called the Design Gem. We really sh reshaped our strategy to not focus so much on trying to help organizations reimagine how they create social change and decided to create a, a space for residents, artists, local community organizers to come together, learn our methodologies, and try to reimagine neighborhood towards reimagining city, towards reimagining world through this process called the design gen. And it's there that we um, teach classes, have time, do book groups. We're just trying to create this uh, sort of community of people who will think with the power, will think you know, with the sort of gravity of world builders at the neighborhood level and hopefully at the, the city level and start to practice world building. Um, and we're trying to spread this idea of design gems um, um, to other parts of, um, to other neighborhoods, other cities and the like. 
Um, we don't necessarily know what that'll look like, but that's um, the big project we're up to. And then there are lots of little projects inside of those um, where we're trying to imagine new relational infrastructures. We work with, um, I don't know if any of you guys are following Keller Easterling, but she's one of our big muses around this. We wrote an article with her called Imaginary Relational Infrastructures. And one that we test a lot is called um, Dance Court, where we question the normative um, um, spatial arrangement of the basketball court and the tennis court as the primary ways that people should move around in space for exercise. We say, why aren't there more spaces that are organized and arranged for people to dance in social life? Um, and why do people have to always sort of make those spaces? Um, and then when they are, they're kind of quasi legal, quasi illegal and immediately policed. And so we say, why don't we have dance courts in cities? Um, and if we did, what would it do to city life? Um, and, and it's, it's sort of a little fun, whimsical experiment, but we think it's with through these that we start to make otherwise possible. Um, and I totally lost my train of thought. It's gone. But I think you've got that a, across. Um, and Marquise has a, a question also that just appeared. Um, how, well, I think, it's um it's it's it for us it's all it's been situational and it's been through working with grassroots organizations that we sort of found arms. So we work with some groups who care about food, um, and they want to reimagine a problem around childhood obesity. We start going a particular route and we imagine an intervention. Or we start working with some people who care about bodies moving in space and are, are really interested in um, spatial justice in public space and organizing people. We do some experiments with them and we wind up with a, a solution. So it's, it's, um, it's been through working with grassroots organizations that we found aspects of life um, to reimagine. Um, and then sometimes they just pop up out of crisis. Like one of the projects that um, we've um, worked on a lot. It's called the Social Emergency Response Center. And a lot of that work really popped up out of all the work that was happening around station violence and a lot of people not having a way to frame it such that they would be implicated in a problem. It was framed as a problem for Black people and not a problem for civil society. And so we started saying state sanctioned violence is a, a problem about politics. It's a problem about the way in which we sort of, it's an American problem. It's not a Black people's problem. And we need to see it as a social emergency. And so that work really led to um, a lot of, of work around what we then created as social emergency response centers. Um, so, and that really emerged from the, the, the cultural zeitgeist at the time. Okay, so I'm gonna throw in one last one which is a summary of the imagination one. Did I? Do you, ha do you have any uh, tech techniques? Oh, I'm sorry, I think you froze, Kenneth. I think okay. I did too. So you're back, back okay. Now? Do you have any techniques that you might recommend for people to kind of exercise their imagination muscles? Not everyone, um, a lot of people have been taught to uh, unlearn their sense of imagination that they might have as a kid, or not every, not all communities have had the privilege of seeing examples of their own community thriving in the in the future. Are there any? Yeah, how how can people build their imagination muscles? Any it's recommendations? So funny because um, I literally had John last semester come to basically have this same conversation with the series that I've been calling imagination methodologies where we say imagination isn't um, a gift um, that some people have and some people don't. They are, imagination is built. And one of the things I think we're saying, at least with IE is a way into imagination is a way into building an appetite and a capacity for imagination is through this analytical piece first, and it's through understanding how the world is arranged and understanding how we um, 
how we are organized to pay attention to effects through the affected and not the arrangements that produce effects, um, that it's through this understanding that we then can start to imagine otherwise and then start to world. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're still testing that. Like, I, that's true. There might be ways that you can come through the imagining back to understanding. I mean, it might not be your path, but I think um, one one sort of um, perspective that we're putting forward is you've got to understand how the world is imagined um, as a way towards it. But I would also say read fiction. Like, like if you you look at um, 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 uh, 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 a crazy speculative. Um, you know, world that's coming out of science fiction, um, maybe that takes you in another direction. Like, so there's like lots of different sort of techniques you can use to start to make, but one of the things we talk about towards imagining the worlds is you have to make the world strange um, as much as you can. You have to understand that it's, it's uh, on the flip side of Marquise's question, have you ever encountered a scenario where the framework didn't quite fit. Um, I'm sure one immediately, but um, but I'm sure it has limitations because um, everything does. Um, but, but nothing immediately um, comes to mind yet, Nicola. Can I answer Kenny's question about why? <laughs> why we asked you to uh, join today. Um, I, I, in DT, we've been very, very much looking for a, a tool set to help us think about complicated systems um, for quite some time. And when your book came out a couple of years ago, three years ago now, I guess, um, yeah, I can three remember years. Can you believe that? I, three years. Yeah, I can remember very distinctly flipping through it, landing on that page spread of the two classrooms, and just like, wow, <laughs> they've they've really hit on um, a perfectly clear example in a way to articulate how interventions into in systems can play out, um, and and what different. Um, seemingly subtle differences in how a system is arranged can have huge impacts or in, in the language of the book effects. Um, so you know, we've, we've integrated the, the book and the framework into our curriculum in various ways. And it's, it, it almost feels like um, we, we uh, asked you <laughs> to come explain it in a much clearer way than than we have inside the curriculum itself. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be using the recording of this in years to come. I feel like to help our students um, find footing in the ideas and arrangements and effects framework. It's 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 been really wonderful. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Kenny, but but there you go. Thank you. Thank you. I think, John, do we uh, do we normally wrap at 10 of to let uh, folks get to their their next class? How do you sign when off? we can? Yes, uh, we <laughs> sign off by saying thank you, guest Kenneth Bailey, for joining us today. <laughs> thank you, Melanie Crean, for moderating this. Uh, thank you all for joining. And uh, we'll see you next time in a couple of weeks for the next uh, Cloud Salon. Have a good one, everyone. Thank Thanks you. so much, Kenneth.